I want to show you some things here. Yeah, they're pretty heavy. How many of you know what these are? Yep, they're weights. Whew, they're heavy. They're weights, and today they represent the burdens in our life. How many of you have burdens in your life? Every one of us does. There was a woman who went to her pastor and she said, she said, Pastor, I'm having a very distressing time in my life. In fact, the distressing time in her life was the fact that she lost her son. Her son was killed in a car accident. And this has been years and years, and she's struggling and having trouble. And she said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. And he told her this. He said, I want you to go and I want you to find a house or a home that has no struggles, no sorrows, or no griefs. He said, and I want you to bring me back a mustard seed. He said, and I'll ease your grief. <laughs> and she went. And she came back several days later, and she was in tears. And she said, thank you. She said, thank you for helping me see that I'm not the only one that deals with difficulties in this life. And that was the point he was trying to tell her, that there's not a home, there's not a house, there's not a person in this place, no matter how big or how small, that doesn't have a burden. Every one of us has a burden. It can be a little burden, and it can be a big burden. But I can almost promise you today that every one of you in here are carrying some sort of a burden in your life. Here's where we get into problems, and I love this illustration, and it's kind of getting off what I, my, my train of thought this morning, but I love this illustration because here's where we get into a problem, and, and, and really what I want to convey to you this morning is, the fa is this fact here, before we get into the message, that, that every one of us has issues, every one of us carries weights, every one of us carries burdens. Now we can look at these weights and say, you know what, they'll make you stronger, and that's true. That's true, they will. The burdens in our life can be stepping stones for growth. They absolutely can. But here's where you and I get into problem, and, and many of us have heard this, and I've used this illustration before, not on stage, but I've used this before. Here's where we get into problem. We say, well, God, you tell us that you won't give us any more than what we can handle. Well, we serve a God that can't lie. We serve a God who, who keeps his promises. Do you believe God keeps his promises? Every one of them? God says, I won't give you more than you can handle. You know, I'm going to provide a way for you to get out of whatever it is you're dealing with. He promises us. He tells us that in the scriptures. But here's where we get into problems. God says, I've only promised you this. This is it. I've only promised you 930 in the morning on Sunday morning on the 7th of September. And you know the burdens and the problems that you have today? This is it. This is what you deal with. But here's what we do. We go back in the past, and we pick these up, the things we can't change. And then we go into tomorrow, and we pick these up. And then we're standing right here in the present with all these burdens and weights. Does that make sense? Let me ask you something. How many of you have been able to go into the past and change your mistakes? Raise your hand if you have. I didn't think so. So really, it's good counsel for me. Why don't we let them there? Now, how many of us can go into tomorrow and change what may or may not happen? You can't? So then, if tomorrow gets here, we'll deal with them then. Let them there. God says, this is what I promised you. This is it. This is it. So God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. We do it to ourselves. We do it. We go back and we pick up the things in the past and we bring them in the present. And we fret and worry about tomorrow, and I'm guilty of this. We fret and worry about tomorrow, <laughs> and Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, sufficient for the day 
the, the problems of tomorrow are sufficient for tomorrow. Don't worry about them. Tomorrow may not even get here for you. It may not even come for me. And if it does come, if it does come, then we'll stand here with these. And that's it. Simple illustration. But every one of us have burdens. And we go through our life and we take the past and we take the future and we bring it into the present and we're overwhelmed. And we wonder why we can't stand. We wonder why when the waves and the difficulties of life come upon us, we wonder where God is and we struggle as Christians. Not that we won't struggle, but I think of those two houses that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7. We all have burdens. Every one of us has them. Some of you have physical handicaps. We have a man that's been in here, it's, it's here, a faithful member of this church, has been in a wheelchair for 43 years, or over 30 years, I'm sorry. We have some that have chronic sickness. We have some that maybe have some sort of abnormality that they can't change, they have no control over. Some of you have spiritual burdens in here today. You know, maybe, it, maybe it's that hurricane, we'll call them Satan, because they give all these, all these hurricanes names. Maybe it's that Hurricane Satan has, has just pounded your life and the, si the surge of sin has soaked your life and you're reaping spiritual consequences today because of it. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. Some of you have emotional burdens. Depression, anxiety. I battled that and still battle it at times. It's because maybe you have a heartache, you had a sorrow, a grief, a loss, a financial reversal. Whatever the problem, whatever the, the, the situation is, we all have problems, we all have cares. And what they do, these weights here, God allows these things in our lives and they can make us stronger. But what they tend to do is weigh us down. They weigh us down. And so, the burdens that you have in life, the burdens that you carry throughout this life. The title of this message, and this is going to be the question, what are you and I to do with our burdens? What are we to do with them? What are we to do with them? We say ultimately, we give them to Jesus. We'll give them to God. And that's the right answer. But the passage of Scripture that I want us to look at today is, is found in Galatians chapter 6. And I want us to know before we read that, that every day that we're here in this earth, it brings to us our own assortment of burdens. And you and I are going to be blessed this morning, not because of me, but because of God's word. You're going to be blessed to study God's answer to that question. What do I do with my burdens? What do I do with my burdens? Look at Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to read through the first eight verses. We'll focus mostly on the first five. We're going to use seven and eight. But, but look at Galatians chapter six. And see, this is for everybody. There's not one of you in here that's excluded from this. If you're a Christian and you have a burden. Paul writes to the church at Galatia and he says this, brethren, he's talking to Christians. He says, if any man be overtaken in a fault, overtaken, be apprehended or taken by surprise, caught red-handed, caught off guard. Those are all the, the meanings of that phrase. He says, if he be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual. Let me stop there. That doesn't mean that you're the, oh, I'm this holier-than-thou person. There are those that think they are. That's not what he's talking about. You which are spiritual, you which are concrete, you which are mature, you which are solid, you who are solid in your faith. Solid in your faith. If you're going around saying, oh, I'm spiritual, you're not solid in your faith. In fact, you're very immature. He says, 
you which are spiritual, you who know the scriptures, you who are mature, restore such a one. How? In the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. Now here we go into verse 2 through verse 8. Bear ye one another's burdens, carry or take up. Bear ye, endure, lift. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. How's that fulfilling the law of Christ? The law of Christ is love. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove, let every man demonstrate his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burdens. Now wait a minute, isn't that contradictory what we just read? We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. For every man shall bear his own burden. But let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God's not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit, that's a capital S, by the way, the Holy Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You have an outline in your bulletin today. And if you want to follow along and take notes in your outline in your bulletin, you can do that. But the first point of this message this morning is this. And it comes out of Galatians chapter 6. It comes out of verse 2, actually, is that some burdens are meant to be shared. Some burdens are meant to be shared by others. By others. What are some burdens that you and I could share with other people? What are some burdens that you and I could, could uh, uh, you know, enlist a, a brother or a sister, someone who's mature to come alongside of us and say, hey, I need your help. I want you to know something. If you're, if you're you say, well, I'm a Christian. And see, I love this family of God here. And I don't know where I would be without this family of God. There's something special about being connected to the family of God. Many of you are disconnected. And so when burdens come your way, you feel like, man, I stand alone. I stand alone. Do you know our ladies group here and our men's group here? I can tell you this, if you're a part of that or if you're affiliated with those groups and burdens come your way and you come alongside of a brother or you come alongside of a sister, they will be your Aaron and her and they will pray for you, they will love you and they will encourage you. It's so important that you and I have that in the church. It's so important to be part of the body of Christ because some burdens are meant to be shared by others. By others. You know, what are, what are some of the burdens we carry around? Poor choices that we've made. We talked about that with the illustration. We go back into the past. Poor choices. Poor choices. Cheating. Cheating. Stealing. Lying. I don't lie. Exaggeration is a form of lie. Unforgiveness. Maybe you have an unforgiving spirit, an unforgiving heart. Slander. Coveting things. Coveting people. Other people's wives, spouses. Coveting. Gambling. Maybe you, maybe you struggle with gambling. God's given you every financial resource you have, and maybe we go blow it away with gambling. Maybe that's a struggle you have. Maybe pornography is a struggle you have. Maybe alcohol is a problem you have. Whatever it may be, these are burdens that can be shared. You know, we can say, you know what? I got this burden. <laughs> and I got this problem. And I can't carry these on my own. And you had a brother or sister that could come alongside of you and pick this up and help you and carry the burden with you. That's what Paul tells us, that we are to bear, we are to lift up, we are to share in one another's burdens. 
as the body of Christ. Oh, we don't come alongside of you and say, oh, what you did's okay. We don't want to, we don't want to enable your lifestyle, but we want you to know if your heart is genuinely repentant and you're carrying burdens because of mistakes, because of choices you made, there are brothers and sisters who will come alongside of you and, and share in those burdens with you. You know why? Because probably at some point in time they've had them too. I need somebody to come bear my burdens with me. I need somebody to talk to. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know what I'm finding out? The loneliest person on the planet is? A pastor. <laughs> Thank God for my pastor's group and my wife. Thank God for my pastor's group and my wife. Some burdens are meant to be shared by others. Verse 2 tells us that. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. When a fellow believer stumbles or falls and that's what we read in verse one he says brethren christians if a man be overtaken in a fault you which you are mature you which are concrete in his faith you that are solid look restore such a one in the spirit of meekness meekness is not weakness it's strength under control meekness considering yourself lest thou be tempted so when a fellow believer stumbles and falls into sin rather than pointing a finger or accusing or shooting our wounded we should reach down and give them a helping hand to lift them up and help them get back on track you and I are supposed to encourage we're supposed to strengthen one another when it comes to faults failures and falling We'll look at verse 2 and verse 3. We read verse 2. We're going to read it again. Verse 2 and verse 3 reveal the only thing that will keep us from doing verse 2. Look here. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Here's the thing that will prevent you from doing verse 2. For if a man thinks himself to be something, he's haughty, he's high-minded. You know what? I would never do a thing like that. I could never fall. I could never do what he did to his wife. I could never do those things. You know what? I don't know how I, he could come into church on Sunday morning and spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in the bar room till closing. I could never do that. Never do that. That's these haughty, high-minded people. If a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Every one of us, every single one of us are susceptible and are capable of falling at any given time. Be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. And when you think you stand, the fall will be great. The fall will be great. So this is the only thing that, that Paul says that will keep us from doing verse 2, is to think of yourself or that you're above ever needing this kind of help. There are people like that. They, they think they're God's gift to the church. They think they're God's gift to humanity. And actually, they feel good about themselves when other people fall. Do you know there's people like that? Because it makes them look good. That's self-righteousness. It's also self-deception. We all need each other at times. Just imagine if you needed the hand of encouragement to reach down and somebody look down their nose at you. We are, Paul tells us, that we're a body. We're a body. We're a, they're the body of Christ. We're a body. We're a local body at Beavertown Bible Church. We're different parts. Not all of us are, are gifted in a part of the body to be used in the same way. We need each other to function in harmony. And so some burdens are meant to be shared by others. And under your first point there, the thing that I just kind of jumped over was our faults and our failures in their outline. Our faults and our failures. The things we fall short in. The things we struggle with. Faults and failures. And I gave you some examples of them. And it's not all inclusive. Well, the second thing I believe gives warrant to, to sharing with other people is, is in your outline there. The next two blanks would be things of sorrow and grief. Things of sorrow and grief. How many of you have experienced or experiencing sorrow and grief in your life? Yep. The Bible says, 
Yea, all who choose to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Sorrow and grief. You know, and I'm not bragging, but I believe in my heart that things in this church are going very smoothly. I do. But I'm cautious. But I'm cautious. And I say that with caution because I know the enemy is real. Be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. Satan, guess where Satan is? He's here this morning. He's right here this morning. Some of you may, may be going, oh, gosh, I hope he's done at 10 o'clock this morning. I got my pot roast in the oven. I need to be out of here by 10, 15. I hope he gets done on time today. And so your mind is straight away from the truth of God's word. Your mind someplace else. Satan has no, no reason to be in bar rooms. Satan has no reason to be in those places because he's already got you bondage there. See, he's here. He's in here. Maybe not him specifically, but he could be. But I know his demons are here. They're here. And they work on me too. It's amazing how you can preach and preach and preach and, and see facials, facial expressions on people's faces in the mornings and, and wonder what they're thinking and then your mouth still moves and preaches out of the Bible. That's, I don't know how that happens. I don't know. I'm thinking, geez, what, what's he thinking this morning? And praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, you know, you keep going. It's just, it's great. God's word is great. God, God sustains. He does. He just carries us through. <clears throat> Sorrow and grief. But I think things are going well here, but I'm cautious. Cautiously optimistic. But at any given time at Beavertown Bible Church, at any given time, we have someone or some people or many people who are under a heavy load of grief. We've had a lot of great services. We've, over the years, we've had great service. Every Sunday morning is a great service. A great spirit. But always there's someone present going through an awful time. I want you to know, if you were to look to the person next to you, to the person to your left, to the person to your right, the person in front of you, the person behind you, I promise you, they're going through a difficult time. And when you think you're going through a difficult time in life, when you think that, that you're on an island by yourself, there's somebody else that's dealing with something maybe even greater than what you're dealing with. Always somebody. And so it's important that you and I would be kind to everyone because everyone has sorrow of some kind. Everyone is carrying a burden of some kind. And so you and I, this should open our eyes and help us to realize and be sensitive to people because they're dealing with burdens. Tragedy, sorrow, disappointment, depression, anxiety, all that stuff, all that stuff that plagues us will we'll hit everybody's home at some point in time. It will visit every house and every person. Now, I have a passage of scripture in Luke, or uh, in Ruth, if I can find Ruth. My goodness, I don't visit Ruth too often here. Sheesh, where'd Ruth go? Somebody tell me where Ruth is at. Yeah, Oh, I'm in 2 Samuel. All right. Okay. In Ruth, look at chapter 2 and verse 13. <clears throat> Sorrow and grief. Death, loss of a family member. Being an outcast, looked down upon. Boy, this fits Ruth. Ruth chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. Ruth was a stranger in a foreign land. She was a stranger. She was, she was an outcast. She was 
uh, expected to be ostracized and to have to do without. But someone came into her life and someone comforted her. Whom have you comforted recently? It's going through a difficult time. Who have you comforted recently? Who has comforted you? The Bible says that we're to bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ, which is love. This is one reason I believe God will allow sorrows to come into our lives. One reason God allows them. Did you hear that? God allows them to come into our lives. is so that we can be comforted and then in turn comfort others who need to be comforted the same way we were. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and look at verse 3, and look at verse 4. He says, Paul says, Blessed be, be God, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Who, God, comforteth us. Comfort, see the ETH? Continually. Continually. It's not just a one-time thing. He continues to comfort us in all of our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them. See here, coming alongside of a brother, comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort or by the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That's a wonderful passage of Scripture. It's a comforting passage of Scripture. You know, a pastor here in this church here years ago told of a lady whose baby died. Now, I know we have some others in here that have lost their unborn child. We have that. Well, this pastor told a, a similar story about a lady who, uh, who had lost her, her son. Her baby had died. And he tried and he tried and he tried. But he couldn't comfort this woman through counseling. It just didn't work. Hours of counseling didn't do it. But then he remembered a woman in his church who had gone through the same exact thing. And what he did was he enlisted her help. And he said this woman did more in five minutes for this lady than he did in hours. You know, there... Uh, Let's not allow our tragedies, let's not allow our burdens in this life to be wasted. God's allowed them in our lives for a reason, to strengthen us, to build us up, not to weigh us down, to strengthen us, to build them up, and then to share them with other people. God wants to use them for good in others. Many of you have been through things in your life that uniquely qualify you to help others that I cannot help. Now, I can give you God's word to bring comfort and bring peace in your life. But in a practical manner, speaking with, uh, dealing with the same things, some of you are uniquely qualified to do that and be able to help in ways that I can't help. And so we need to be patient. We need to be kind. We need to be understanding and understand that everyone has burdens. I'll guarantee you that no matter who you lock eyes with in this building this morning, no matter how big or how small, they have a burden in their life. J. Vernon McGee told a story. I have a lot of his resources in my office, and I use some of his resources for my Bible studies. But he, said of a, he told of a church member in his congregation that criticized him for ignoring him. He said he ignored me on the subway. And that wasn't uh, Vernon McGee. That wasn't his normal way. He didn't normally do those things. I mean, he wouldn't be, be that way. And so he asked the man in his congregation, he says, when was this? I mean, tell me when it was. And then when the man told him when it was, J. Vernon McGee remembered that day. And he remembered the information, the news that he had got, the bad news that he had just heard. And the burden that he was carrying. And he apologized. J. Vernon McGee apologized to the congregant as he told him and explained the situation to him. And you know what? That man's heart was broke. And he empathized and realized that his pastor wasn't perfect. And he realized that his pastor had a life of his own. He realized that his pastor was human. And he realized that his pastor didn't exist always at all times for, for the needs of others, all the time. 
and he apologized. And that guy, he said, over time became more patient and understanding. The guy saw the humanity in his pastor. So lift a burden with a kind word. Lift a burden with a note because some burdens are meant to be shared with other people. We get missionary letters. I get emails from our missionaries. I pray for our missionaries in my office when I get their email. I think when they, their emails come to me, I pray for them. Do you know why? They have lots of burdens. They're carrying burdens. And we need to pray for our missionaries, every single one of them. When you get their letters, pray for them because there are some burdens that are just worthy sharing. That's verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. There are some burdens that are meant to be shared with others. That's verse 2. Now look down at verse 5. It almost seems contradictory. For every man shall bear his own burden. It's not contradictory. What it's telling us, and I believe it's talking about two different kinds of burdens. Some are meant to be shared by others, but some burdens are meant to be shouldered alone. Some burdens are meant to be shouldered alone. Verse 5 there. For every man shall bear his own burdens. There are some burdens which no one else can help you with in this life. There are some examples of burdens to be shouldered. And in your outline there, it's the consequences of personal sin. The consequences of personal sin. We live in a day and a time in which people want to sin, but they want to ignore the consequences. They want to avoid them. They do everything they can to avoid them. And you know what? When they ask for forgiveness, they scratch their head and they say, hmm, I don't understand. I asked for forgiveness, but why are there still consequences? Look, the forgiveness doesn't erase the consequences. There are still consequences for, th for the things that we do. <clears throat> the attitude today is, is that it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's your fault. We don't want to take responsibility for our own actions. It's the way your parents raised you. You know, I had a dominating mother. Okay. My father rejected me. My mom made me eat oats too early. I don't know. <laughs> she made me play with dolls. I don't know. You know, we have this whole victim mentality. And, and look, <clears throat> now I want to be sensitive here too because I'm not minimizing the effects that, that your past can sometimes have on you. Because it can. It certainly can. But I'm saying this, that in Jesus Christ, you can get past your past. You can get past it. When you take on the, form of the former attitude, the victim's mentality, then you are shrugging off all personal responsibility for your life. You develop a, a victim's mentality and everything is someone else's fault. And you know what? We're in, we're in a mess in America today because we don't take personal responsibility for the choices we make. I was just down at the bank on Thursday to take care of some financial stuff for the church. And I looked over across the parking lot and I saw all these repos. And I was talking to the lady in, in the bank about all the house repossessions. And here's the mentality. It's not my fault. I told the bank if they could have given me 60 more days, I could have made my payment. But what about everything that led up to that? It wasn't, that didn't just happen. Well, the bank gave me the money. It's their fault. They told me I could do it. It's their fault. I mean, that's the mentality. That's the mentality of, of our society today. It's everybody else's fault. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. The fact of the matter is, I watched Fox News here a couple weeks ago, and they reported on there, I don't know, remember if it was Sean Hannity or somebody was talking about it, they talked about this newspaper in St. Louis, uh, this St. Louis newspaper, and, it, and it, it reported, listen to this, this is, this is ridiculous. They reported that killers, killers, people that murder people, that killers become killers for two reasons. This is, what, this is what they reported. One, they had a difficult delivery at birth. And the second thing, 
was that they were rejected by their mother. That's why killers become killers. It's mom's fault. It's the doctor's fault. I had nothing to do with this. Had nothing to do with their choice to take a life, huh? Well, the article didn't end there. It went on to say this, that if forceps were used on you when you were born, you have a, highly, a higher likelihood to kill people one day. With what, forceps? I, I don't know. I understand that certain things in our past predispose us to certain things, but by golly, we still have a choice to make. We still have a choice to make. We're responsible. And the, the fact of the matter is that when we make our bed, guess who has to lay in it? We do. We do. Some burdens are meant to be shouldered alone. The consequences of personal sin. You know, it's, it's, it's true that our parents' lifestyle may have exposed you to adultery. Your parents' lifestyle may have exposed you to anger. It may have exposed you to lying. It may have exposed you to gossip. But you still have a choice to make when tempted with immorality. And we can rise above it and break the cycle if we want to with God's help. I want you to know there's victory in Jesus if you want it. But we like to play the blame game. The blame game. We're world famous for passing the buck. Where did that come from? Where did it come from? We're world famous for not taking responsibility. We're world famous for, for passing the buck. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Well, we, I think we get it honestly. We get it honestly. We get it from our parents. <laughs> and our parents got it from their parents. And their parents got it from their parents. And then it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam said, God, it's the woman you gave me. And we've been using that one ever since, haven't we? And then the woman said, God, it was the snake. Referring to Adam. No, 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 referring to the serpent. <laughs> referring to Satan. When will we grow up? When will we rise up? And when will we fess up? and say, I'm responsible. We can choose to sin, but we can't choose the consequences. In fact, look at verse 7 and verse 8. It says, being of our main text, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and verse 8, it says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We have a free will, and so does God when he reads our meter. If you sin physically, don't be surprised if you suffer physically. Don't be surprised at all. We reap what we sow. The next burden that we shoulder alone, and we talked about these the last two weeks, is our judgment. We spent the last two Sunday mornings talking about judgment, the judgment of the lost, the last the last event in human history. We spent two weeks talking about that. And this is a burden that you and I are going to share alone. Hebrews 9.27 says that it is appointed unto man once to die, or to die once, and then what? The judgment. That applies to Christians and non-believers, both. Everyone here will someday stand before God, listen, alone alone I can't stand with you I got to stand alone your parents won't stand with you your friends won't stand with you your attorney won't stand with you because probably he won't be in heaven no I'm just kidding I'm just kidding I'm just I, I shouldn't have said that <clears throat> sheesh that's wrong that's so I have to edit that out of the film <clears throat> but your attorney can't stand with you you and I have to, man, that messed me up. You and I have to give an account alone, every one of us. Every single one of us. And this is a burden that we're going to share alone. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at the Christian. Paul's writing here about the judgment seat of Christ. This is for Christians. 
This is your judgment, Christians. Last two weeks we talked about the lost judgment. This week here we're going to just use this as an illustration and not get too deep into it, but this is the judgment seat of Christ, or if you want to term it, the Bema. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, and verse 11, Paul writes, For we must, how many? All. I love that. We got like a choir. That was good. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There you go. And you can write out in your margin, B-E-M-A. That's the judgment for Christians. That everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, or to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest, or known unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Paul tells us, that the saved will be secure. Yes, no doubt about it. But we're still going to have to answer at our judgment. And thank God the Christian sin has already been judged on Calvary. But you and I as Christians are going to give an account for how carefully or how carelessly we lived our Christian life. Some will suffer loss. Now, I don't exactly know what that means. Maybe loss of rewards. We've always preached that. We've always taught that. I'm sure that's the case. The Bible says the, the wood, the hay, and the stubble will be burned away, and what's left will be what you get. So those worthless things in life. But is there some other form of loss? I don't know. I don't know. But I don't want to find out. But if you think you can live a haphazard Christian life and get away with it, you're badly and sadly mistaken. How do we serve God? This is a challenge for you. It's a challenge for me. How do we serve God with our time? How do we serve God with our time? How do we serve God with our talents to edify the body? How do we do that? Are you doing that? Are you giving your time? Are you giving your talents? Are you, are you giving your gifts that God has given you to the church? Are you using your resources to give back to God? Because he's given them, them to you. Your finances. God gave them all to us. Your children. God gave them to you. Your spouse. Our service will be judged. Paul talks about here. And this is a burden that's going to be shouldered alone. Our service will be judged. Our stewardship. Our motives. And then rewards will be given for that which was done truly for Christ who understands and who knows the heart. Look back at one more, look back at another passage of Scripture there in Revelation chapter 20. We just spent the last two weeks talking about this. Here's the other burden that's going to be shouldered alone. So you as a Christian are going to stand before God alone at the Bema judgment, the Bema seat, judgment seat. This is the great white throne. We talked about this the last two weeks, and this is going to be shouldered alone too. Revelation 20, verse 12 to 15, it says, And, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the dead, and death and hell were delivered up, and death and dead, and, and the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lost will have no hope at their judgment. They will stand before God with the burden of sin still on their back. they got to pay for their own sins. There's only one sin. We talked about this the last couple of weeks. There's only one sin that will ever send a person to hell. And that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that is unbelief, that is rejecting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you need to be saved today, and you reject the opportunity, then you're inviting the scene that we just read to take place alone before God in your life. And you and your burden will be cast into the lake of fire. 
No matter which judgment you appear at, all the veneer, all the excuses are stripped away. It's just you and God. Our life, the way we live it, and who we live it for, the results of that life will be judged by Christ with you and you alone. And I want to get through this last point today because we're almost at the end. He says that, and the third point of this message is this. Not a, let me back up. Some burdens are meant to be shared. Some burdens with others. Some burdens are meant to be shouldered alone. And they will. And then the third point is that some burdens are meant to be shed. 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 I want you to look back in Psalm 55. I want you to look back in Psalm 55. This is not in our original text, but Psalm 55 and verse 22. Look what Mashal writes. Psalm 55, or not Mashal. Yeah, Mashal, Psalm 55, verse 22. And it says, Cast thy burden upon who? The Lord. And he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. It says, He shall sustain thee. There's not a burden that we have to carry ourselves unless we, unless we insist upon it. And you know what? And so many people insist to do that. Jesus is our great burden barrier. And sometimes we cling to a burden and try to carry it ourselves. And we can be deceived into thinking that God wants us to carry something by ourselves as if we're somehow serving God by doing it. We're being noble by doing it. But some burdens he wants to carry for us if we'll let him. Can you think of any in here this morning that you can give to the Lord? Aren't you glad that he carried the one on Calvary's cross? That he carried that burden for you? Many other burdens here this morning too. Look at Matthew chapter 11. And look at verse 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11 one of my favorite passages in the whole entire Bible, Matthew 28, or Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Jesus says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Look at verse 29. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. He says, Take my yoke. Yoke is a burden, folks. Yoke is a burden. And he desires to trade us burdens. Jesus wants to trade us burdens. What's the yoke that he's talking about there? In verse 29, I believe he's talking about his teaching. Take my yoke upon upon you and learn of me. He wants to give us, he wants to switch us burdens. He says, because my yoke, he says, uh, I'm lowly in heart, my yoke is light. And I will give you rest in verse 30. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. He wants to trade us burdens. When it's more than you can bear, and you don't think you can take another step, you can lay it on Jesus. Someone once said this, and I wrote it down here in the margin of my, uh, my outline here, is that the wind and the waves that are over our heads are under his feet. The winds and the waves that are over our head, that consume us, are under his feet. In 1 Peter, in your outline it says 2 Peter, but in 1 Peter, it's actually 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter writes that we need to cast all of our cares upon him, all of them. For he careth for you. For some reason, sometimes, we feel like we can make it ourselves, but there are times when we need to let go and permit God to wait bearer. One of these two things will happen if we cast our if we shed our burdens. In your outline there, one of the two things will happen. The Lord will lift our burden. And I believe he can. Do you believe he can? He can do that. I've seen people who've had a health need. 
I've seen people uh, who've been struggling physically, emotionally, and mentally, and pray, and I've seen things go away. I've seen it happen. People had a financial need. In the right spirit, they've prayed to God, and God has always provided for them financially. It's always great when that's how it works, when that's how it happens, but I want you to know that's not always how God works. That's not always how he works. And, I, and you don't have to turn back to it. It should be on your screen. In Psalm 55, 22, it says, He shall sustain what? It? Does it say it? The. It's the burden. He shall sustain the. Sometimes the Lord doesn't lift the burden. Sometimes, and the second point of that there in verse 3, the second thing is there, sometimes the Lord will lift you. He will lift you. He will pick you up with the burden, and he will carry you. In fact, Paul wrote uh, in 2 Corinthians, I want us to look at one more scripture, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 7 to 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The Apostle Paul is an example of this, that the Lord lifting him, picking him up, Three times he asked God to take away the burden that he was carrying. We preach about this. I preach about this. uh, We preach about this all the time and say that God's answer was no. God said, no, I'm not going to remove that from you. But I'll give you grace. Let me give you another thought about this passage. But really, three times God said yes. I'll lift that burden, but Paul, I'll lift you too. I'll lift you too. That's what he said, but he said, my grace is sufficient enough for you. I'll not only lift that burden, but I'll lift you too. Some of you are getting bitter towards God because you've asked him to lift your burdens, and it doesn't seem that that he has done that. But please realize that it may be his will to lift you and carry you and that burden through it all. But when we throw a temper tantrum, we don't allow him to carry us or that burden. Psalm 55, 22 says, he shall sustain me. It's the last illustration, but there was a man walking down the road, and I know you, probably many of you have heard this. He had a big sack of potatoes on his shoulders. He was carrying it just like this. He was walking down the road. And it was heavy and it was burdensome. And this guy came along in a pickup truck and said, Mister, do you need a ride? He said, I sure do. I could use a ride. He said, where are you headed? And he told him where he was going. He said, hop in. I'll give you a ride. So he hopped in the truck and he sat in his seat and he was holding that 50-pound sack of potatoes still on his lap and his shoulder. The guy driving the truck said, said, put those down. He said, you don't have to carry those. He says, uh, he said, it's not a problem. It's not an issue. Put them down. And he replied, no, sir, I won't do that. I'm not going to do that. It's enough that you had to take me to town. He said, I'm not going to ask you to carry these taters. <laughs> but listen, aren't we like that? Aren't we like that in our Christian walk? Aren't we like that? And that's just what we do to the Lord sometimes. That's exactly what we do. Some of you today are carrying a burden that the Lord maybe never intended you to carry, but you seem to be insistent upon it. I love the old song, I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. We're going to sing that today as we close.
And I want to encourage you today, if you're carrying a burden around, or if you have heaped up in this very present moment things from the past and things from the present, or from the uh, future and the past, and you've put them on your plate today in this present, and you're burdened, whatever it is. Look, you all raised your hand this morning that you're carrying weights and burdens today. There isn't a reason why every one of you shouldn't be at this altar of prayer, including me. If you have a burden this morning, if you have business to do with the Lord, and you want to cast it upon Him, I encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Would you stand with me? Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for the scriptures there in Galatians chapter 6. You teach us that we are, to, we are to bear one another's burdens. There certainly are burdens in this life that we are to share with other people. And Lord, as Psalm 55, 22 lets us know that, that there, are, there are burdens that we need to shed, Lord. But also in Galatians chapter, five, or chapter 6, verse 5, it tells us that there are burdens that we are going to shoulder alone. Lord, ultimately, we need to cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. And I pray this morning, if there's anybody here, oh Lord, that has a burden that they want to give to you today, they have business that they want to do with you, Lord, they can come this morning right here to this altar of prayer, and they can give their hearts to you this morning. They can lay those burdens down right here at this altar, never to pick them up again. Thank you, Lord, for hearing the answering prayer, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with singing hymn number 430, I Must Tell Jesus. And if you have something to tell Jesus this morning, I encourage you to come and lay at this altar. I Must Tell Jesus, hymn number 430. I must tell Jesus all of my I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Of that song says this, that I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. There was about 99% of you in here this morning that said you have troubles and burdens and griefs and sorrows in your life. Don't be ashamed. Don't be prideful. Don't hold it in. You can come this morning. It's okay to come to this altar of prayer and have somebody put their hand and their arm around you. The Bible says bear one another's burdens this morning. You have a burden this morning that's on your heart. Come this morning and pray with a brother, with a sister, and lay your burdens here at the altar of prayer as we continue to sing. Tell Jesus this morning. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I is a kind, compassionate friend. If I
pray for those that are in their pews, Lord, that have burdens as well. I pray that you would, you would encourage them to do the same thing, to let their burdens right where they stand. And as they step out of those pews this morning, to let them there, never to pick them up. Lord, you're a glorious God. You're a God of, of you're a giver of life. You're a sustainer of life, Lord. And you promise, Lord, to, to, to make us, we are whole in you. We are complete in you. But Lord, we can stand in the midst, in the face of adversity and difficult times, knowing that we have a God above who is for us. And Lord, if he is for us, Lord, who can be against us? We thank you for that. Go with us as we leave this place this morning. Let us encourage one another today as we leave here and give you the glory for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Sunday school class in here this morning will begin at 11 or 1045.